God, thank you for this uh, strategic objective workshop on religious liberty. God, thank you that we are at Colorado Christian University right now praying uh, and asking you uh, for our country to understand and to grant freedom uh, for religious liberties. God, I just pray in advance for all of the speakers who have something uh, deep in their heart, deep in their soul, that they have worked out with you uh, that they want to say to this community of faculty and staff. So God, thank you for each one of our speakers. Give them the right words that you want them to say and give them the boldness to say it. So God, thank you uh, for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Christmas season. The sights, the sounds, our carolers singing such beautiful uh, music as we walk in. Thank you in advance for our luncheon, uh, for Chef Sheila and the group that have prepared food for us. So God, thank you for our time today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. President Armstrong. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. I don't know how many of you were at the uh, lighting ceremony at 5 yesterday afternoon, but uh, I had this terrific sense of nostalgia and uh, tradition and the presence of Jesus, and it, it was just, it was a wonderful occasion. And here we are again this morning, and the carolers and the musicians, and it's just great, isn't it? Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. And so we've called you together not to rejoice about Christmas, we're going to do that a couple of hours from now, but to consider one of the gravest and most serious threats in our country's history to the great tradition of religious liberty, which is in the DNA, in the, in the, in the very essence of what it means to be an American. The threat of religious liberty, the attack on religious liberty in America today is an existential threat to churches, Christian colleges and universities, to Christian businessmen and women, to pastors. Uh, I, I can't exaggerate, I think, the seriousness of this issue. But as we begin a couple of hours of discussion of the nature of the threat, I want to say right up front, your first impulse as you consider this, and I know many of you have been thinking about this issue for a long time, your first issue may to get be to get angry. Let me caution you to get past that very quickly because anger is not going to resolve this problem. It's, it's, it's a natural human reaction perhaps, but anger is not a spiritual strategy. Uh, second, uh, you may uh, have at some point during the discussion or at some other time as you contemplate the nature and seriousness of the threat, you may want to become discouraged. Don't do that because I'll just, without tipping my hand about the ultimate outcome of this conversation, and an encore of some aspects of this conversation at the next meeting of the Strategic Objective Workshop, I'll just tell you in advance, we're going to win. I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you uh, exactly how I think this is likely to play out, but uh, bad as the situation is, and it's, it's, we're in for a rough ride the next year or two or three or four, and maybe longer. Bad as it is, we're going to win. God is not going to let us down about that. So my request to you is this. Let's just all clear our minds. Let's focus for the next 110 or 120 minutes on the religious liberty, which has been the most important part of the heritage of our country since the moment that the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock until this very day, on the seriousness of the threat. And then in due course, we'll talk about what God's calling us to do to defend and protect that liberty. Let's bow our heads and then I'll call Jim McCormick forward. Father, I just pray that every one of my colleagues will join me in clearing our thoughts of every distracting notion and for the next two hours focus intently upon this threat. In my opinion, one of the worst threats of its kind in all of human history. 
And so uh, please forgive our sins. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Make us the men and women you want us to be. And sharpen our intellect and give us wisdom as we consider this crucial topic. In, God, in Jesus' name we pray and to his glory. Amen. Jim McCormick. Thank you, sir. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a beautiful day in God's country today to uh, be at CCU. Uh, we want to take a look at a very, I think, mission-oriented, obviously, topic uh, this morning. We have a lot of different uh, speakers who we want to present in different ways. Uh, but right now, the women's bas volleyball team is locked in a fifth-game battle uh, at the National Christian College Championships in Florida. Ralph, any news? Oh, so we are right there. <clears throat> this is a team who swept the regions five straight games, not losing, not losing a match, and won two matches yesterday in the national, and they are victorious right now. All right, so the women have uh, won that. That puts them in the semifinals this evening, and hopefully the championship uh, tomorrow uh, for the national Christian college, which frankly we've dominated uh, recently um, with... Um, men's golf and some other things so um, it's great I also uh, just want to take a quick second for those of you who contributed to the northern Arapahoe Wind River Reservation trip over Thanksgiving it was a great time 26 students and I went uh, up we fed 220 with food baskets in the uh, school and on Tuesday night fed six over 600 this year in our community meal um, that has grown from 180 to 620 ish in just three years. So um, it is an amazing, uh, amazing time. So thank you for your donations there. Well, we want to give you a, kind of an overview of this topic today as we look at religious liberty. And we want to do that in some different ways. First, we want to talk about the history of religious liberty in this country and then kind of look at uh, what it has meant uh, to this country and, and to the world. And then we have. Uh, um, a, a segment of, of really issues of the day, kind of the what's happening right now, the cases that are happening, some of the issues that are happening with religious liberty. We want to end that up with some tips and then turn it all over to the Lord before we eat with uh, communion. So that's, that's kind of uh, our goal. But for those of you who read World Magazine, who does that in here? Uh, okay, you're going to hear that as a tip uh, later. I noticed a, an article recently in there about a football coach in Bremerton, Washington, Bremerton High School in Bremerton, Washington, Joe Kennedy. And we have Skype uh, Coach Joe in, and Coach is going to join us uh, right now. Um, and uh, Joe, uh, we are bringing you up. There he is. Uh, hi, Joe. Uh, you're wearing a, you're representing today. We like that. Yes. <laughs> now, Coach Joe's uh, situation uh, as an assistant football coach in Bremerton, Washington, was that seven years ago, he began to move out after the games to midfield and just pray silently by himself. Over the years, some, some parents and, and players have, have joined him, but never at his request, uh, just because of the, the model uh, he, was, he was setting there. And recently, an uh, alum of the school, an atheist, went to the school board and complained about this situation, that he was using this form to pray after the football game. The school board uh, unanimously went that way and said to coach, you may not engage in demonstrative religious activity readily observable to students and the attendant public. And so October 16th was a big day, I know coach, as uh, homecoming came, he was told to stop that before homecoming. Uh, homecoming came on the 16th, and uh, we'll let you kind of take it from there, Joe. Tell us a little bit about What's happening um, with this situation and, and uh, where you're kind of at with it, Coach? Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that battle from, from the beginning, I'm like, I have been doing this, and, you know, it's it's actually spread from not just uh, with, with me praying, but also with my entire team and actually every single team within our league and some of the ones outside of our league have joined us on the 50, you know, to give thanks after every single game. and. I, I'm just amazed that, uh, you know, our superintendent for the school district and our um, high school principal and even our head coach, they're, they're all Christians, and yet every single one of them have really backed down from this and 
was afraid to stand up to for their rights as an American, and you know, especially as a Christian, you know, it, I, I'm I'm just bewildered and and you know frustrated and like the guy said earlier, it, it's hard not to be angry and discouraged when you you put so much into these young men and they tell you you can't even get you know you know thanks to whoever you believe in and. After a, game, a football game is over, I'm, I'm just amazed at where America is these days. So, yeah, I've really been battling for uh, months now, and they suspended me from the last four games of the football season. I wasn't able to go out with my football team, and I had to sit in the stands and actually watch them, which is extremely tough. Yeah, I, I can imagine that, uh, Coach. Um, Coach, this, this started just as a, something you wanted to do after each game to go out to midfield and, and give thanks to the Lord. And, and over the years, it sounds like people have joined you, but never at your request, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I, I started out that watched uh, Facing the Giants. Uh, it was kind of a God thing. He, he had, I got offered the job um, on a Friday, and uh, I was doing some serious praying because it's a huge commitment to these young men. And, the people in our community to coach football. And I saw that movie in the middle of the night and it was like God spoke to me, hey, this is your calling. And I just started, I, I made a you know, confirmation with God right there that I was going to you know, take a knee and I was gonna give you know, thanks after every single game and give him the glory. And I, I never asked any of the kids or any of the other coaches or any of the other teams. It, it all became more they just said, hey, Coach, can we join you? And I said, this is America. You've got the freedom to do whatever you want. So yeah, it, it was that's where it came from. And then our, our students and our team started inviting the other teams. And it just became a, a great tradition in that moment of peace after a football game where two teams could come together and just give thanks for the good competition and, and for each other. Now, now, Coach, before uh, the alum who's an atheist came forward to the school board this year, was there ever any fallout, any kickback to what you were doing, what was occurring after each game? No, there wasn't. As uh, a matter of fact, uh, I, I did have quite a few parents uh, over the years, some students who did not have any kind of faith whatsoever, and they asked if this was something that they had to do, and I said, no, absolutely not. And we have great communication with uh, the, the kids on our team and the parents and, and people in our community here. And we just have that open dialogue and say, no, that's not mandatory. And if they want to come out and just observe or stay where they're at, uh, they're free to go after a football game. So they, they basically could do whatever they want. And after those conversations, and they knew I wasn't trying to convert anybody or you know preaching to anybody, I was just giving thanks. Everybody was really cool with it. Um, it it's interesting, uh, it wasn't even the atheists that even started the whole thing. That was kind of the driving force behind it. There was a, one of the administration people uh, from another school that's, that witnessed it at one of our away games, and they gave our, our uh, high school principal a compliment and said how awesome it was to see what we were doing in our football program. So that's what really started the whole entire thing was a compliment. Coach, we, uh, just one final question. We know what happened uh, after the homecoming game, after you were told not to continue, and then you went out after the homecoming game and, and uh, to do your prayer again. And a lot of the stands emptied out. Both teams joined you. Uh, it sounded like there was a lot of community support for this. Yes, that was the most incredible thing, is that we had people from not just here in Washington, but we had people coming up from California and Oregon. And if you can imagine a high school football game, I, I, we usually have maybe 300 people in the stands. We had both sides and the, the stadium was completely packed and we had a couple thousand people out there on the 50 praying with me and you know, people actually just stand up for what they believe in, in, in support of, you know, our, our religious liberties. We need to do that. And that's my final question, Coach. How many uh, of the parents and local community members have been in front of the school board on this issue? Oh my goodness. Uh, and I, I've only been to one of them, and it was a completely packed house. But every single one of the, uh, the school board meetings now, 
they're completely packed with people that are that are out there really trying to do what's right and stand up for our freedoms as Americans. And they've been getting flack, some some serious blowback from all of this. Everybody's coming against them. They get thousands of emails and phone calls and letters every single you know week since this whole thing has started. And I've been getting tons of support and it's, it's, I hate to think that it's it's me. I, I think it's God really working in, in America today saying, hey, we need to stand up as Americans and Christians and, and just stand up for what we believe in because it is our right. Well, Coach, I know the Liberty Institute has uh, offered to uh, um, represent you in a lawsuit uh, against the uh, school board. Are you going forward with that? Oh, absolutely. One thing that beats ever is I served in this ring for 10 years. And, you know, we don't back down from fights. And, uh, <laughs> that's exactly what, what I'm doing. I'm not going to back down to anybody, and I'm going to stand up for what is right. No. Yeah, so just uh, to reiterate, you are you are currently suspended with pay, correct? That is correct. Okay, well, thank you for mentioning your, your Marine Corps service. We salute you and thank you for your service to our country. <laughs> Coach, uh, we salute you uh, for your situation up there. We ask that the Lord would give you strength and perseverance uh, in this case. Uh, we know that he's in control of it, and we're anxious to hear where it goes forward. And uh, go Broncos, we'll have you down for a game sometime. <laughs> Thanks, Coach. You never be blessed. Thank you. Well, I think uh, this starts to frame a little bit about what we're talking about. Um, you know, technically, when the game is over, the coach's duties are over, and even after that, he, he's finding it hard to go out into the middle of the field and, and share a silent prayer uh, that's not even you know, rallying the team to go out. The next one, um, I'm, I'm glad that, that the uh, president talked about storing your anger, because the next one will we'll bring it up. Um, <laughs> but this, I think, couches exactly um, what's going on in our culture today. So let's hear from... Senator Pat Stedman, a Colorado senator from District 31 here. To make sure that this separation between religious belief and what's happening here in our state code, in our statutes, our civil laws, are kept separate. For Senate Bill 11 respects religious freedom. This bill does not reach into anyone's church or mosque or synagogue. You can have all the free exercise there that you want. Exercise it as you see fit, but don't let your free exercise run my life. Don't claim religion as a reason the law should discriminate. We have laws against discrimination. Discrimination is banned in employment and housing and public accommodations. And so bakeries that serve the public aren't supposed to look down their noses at one particular class of persons and say, we don't sell cakes to you. Mm. It's troubling, this discrimination, and it's already illegal. So, what to say to those who claim that religion requires them to discriminate? I'll tell you what I'd say. Get thee to a nunnery and live there then. Go live a monastic life away from modern society, away from the people you can't see as equals to yourself, away from the stream of commerce where you may have to serve them or employ them or rent banquet halls to them. Go someplace and be as judgmental as you'd like. Go inside your church, establish separate water fountains in there if you want, but don't claim that free exercise of religion requires the state of Colorado to establish separate water fountains for her citizens. That's not what we're doing here. Need I say more? Uh, one of our Colorado legislators um, addressing the House there uh, about this issue. So we want to kind of go back a little bit, start a little bit at the beginning, and talk about religious liberty and how it came to be and how this country uh, benefited from it right off the bat. We've asked Dr. Gary Stewart 
uh, to come and uh, take us through some of that history. Dr. Stewart. Religious liberty is the freedom to worship and live according to one's religious convictions and conscience without fear of punishment or government reprisal. Religious liberty is not only a matter of how one worships on Sundays, but of how one lives out their lives according to their religious convictions and according to conscience. Many of the English colonists who came to this country did so to obtain religious liberty. The pilgrims and the Puritans risked their lives and suffered great deprivation for themselves and their children in order that they might secure uh, the freedom to worship and live according to their religious convictions and conscience without fear of punishment or government reprisal. But ironically, not long after they arrived in the New World, those in Massachusetts began to persecute those who dissented from their beliefs and practice of congregational Puritanism. What they had in fact wanted was religious liberty for themselves and for their convictions, but not for those of others. After he was exiled from Massachusetts for his religious views, the Baptist Roger Williams requested and obtained a royal charter to conduct what he called a lively experiment in 1663. A lively experiment, the establishment of a colony which provided a religious liberty for a plurality of religious views. Williams obtained a charter which read, No person within the said colony at any time hereafter shall be anywise molested, punished, disquieted, are called in question for any differences in matters, in opinion, in matters of religion, and do not actually disturb the civil peace of our said colony, but that all and every person and persons may from time to time and at all times hereafter freely and fully have and enjoy his and their own judgments and consciences in matters of religious concernments throughout the tract of land hereafter mentioned. William Penn, a Quaker, drew up a frame of government that was similar, giving religious toleration uh, in the proprietary colony of Pennsylvania as well. And the other colonies had different degrees of religious liberty uh, up until the American Revolution, from the Carolinas granting full religious toleration from their founding, and yet persecution of certain minority Christian groups continued uh, until the American Revolution. The American Revolution was not fought simply over the issues of taxation and tea. It was fought by many who believed that their religious liberty was at stake. When the infamous Stamp, the Stamp Act was declared uh, void in 1766, Parliament issued a declaratory act declaring that Parliament possesses authority over the colonies in all cases whatsoever. This assertion, coupled with the uh, reported plan to establish bishops and bishops' courts in America, as well as the curtailing of traditional rights and liberties, the closing of the Port of Boston, the establishment of martial law in the colony of Massachusetts, the refusal of trial by jury, etc., made religious liberty a real issue in the American Revolution. The American revolutionaries viewed our civil and religious rights as being intertwined, and a threat to one was a threat to another. So John Witherspoon, uh, who was the president of the College of New Jersey, a strong supporter of, of American independence, said, there is not a single instance in history in which civil liberty was lost and religious liberty preserved entire. And therefore, we yield up our temporal property. Uh, if, therefore, we yield up our temporal property, we at the same time deliver the conscience into bondage. John Adams saw civil and religious liberties as connected as well. He said, if Parliament can tax us, that is arbitrarily and without uh, representation and due process, if Parliament can tax us, then they could establish the Church of England with all its creeds, articles, tests, ceremonies, and ties, and prohibit all other churches. So it's not widely recognized, but the American Revolution, the issue of religious liberty was very important for the American revolutionaries. Here's a print from the Revolutionary War period. I'm not sure if you can see the text, but it looks like there's a ship at the harbor. They're hoping to land a bishop with the bishop's carriage in the background on the ship. And the, the colonists are meeting this ship. Uh, this uh, period, this, this print was entitled, An Attempt to Land a Bishop in America. And that included the enforcement 
of a state religion upon the colonies. The, the, page is on, the page on the wharf in the foreground reads, shall they be obliged to maintain bishops who cannot maintain themselves? And banners of the protesters in the cartoon, in, in the print read, no lords, spiritual or temporal, in New England, and liberty and freedom of conscience. And the protesters are holding books entitled Locke, Calvin's Works, Sydney on Government, and Barclay's Apology. This print illustrates that the establishing and preserving of American religious liberty is really foundational to who we are as a country, and our country was in fact founded and built upon it in this sense from the very beginning. In the new nation, the new national government set up the First Amendment, passed to ensure that the new national government would not restrict the religious liberties of individuals. The First Amendment reads, of course, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. As assemblies met to draw up new constitutions in the states, there were many who successfully fought to see religious liberty advanced at the state level as well, especially James Madison and Thomas Jefferson. George Mason was aided by Madison in drawing up the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which passed in 1776. It, it reads, that religion or the duty which we owe to our Creator and the manner of discharging it can be direct, directed only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. And therefore, all men are equally entitled to the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. Jefferson labored for a similar position and bill in Virginia. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, so-called, was an especially strong defender of religious liberty. He argued in 1785 that it is the duty of every man to render to the Creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. This duty is precedent both in order of time and in degree of obligation to the claims of civil society. Madison is arguing here that the rights of conscience to honor and obey God precede and come before whatever rights and duties are derived from the state. We do not receive religious liberty as a right from government but from the fundamental duty that we owe to God as created individuals. Because we owe God a primary duty, that gives us the right to fulfill the duty that we have before our God. Madison wanted an even stronger wording of the First Amendment, wording which would have made explicit that the restrictions on the national government regarding religion would be applied to the states as well. This is Madison's proposal for the First Amendment back here at the bottom. The civil rights of none shall be abridged on account of religious belief or worship, nor shall any national religion be established, nor shall the full and equal rights of conscience be in any manner or in any pretext infringed. When discussing private property and property rights, Madison said very simply, conscience is the most sacred of all property. Massachusetts became the last state to end a formal establishment of religion in 1833, even though states continued to possess jurisdiction in religious matters. But by the 1940s, the U.S. Supreme Court began using the 14th Amendment to incorporate the First Amendment guarantee of religious liberty and apply that, the First Amendment restrictions, uh, to the state governments as well. But by the mid-20th century, the contemporary erosion of religious liberty by the federal government, in my mind, began with the activist Warren Court of the 1960s. And there's a whole series of court cases, but really beginning with the 1962 uh, court case, where the Supreme Court has sought to remove the free exercise of religion from the public sphere. So in Engel versus Vitali, 1962, the court famously ruled that even non-sectarian prayers composed by school officials for voluntary use of its students were a violation of the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. The following year, the court ruled that school-sanctioned Bible reading in public schools is unconstitutional. In 1985, in the Wallace ruling, 
The court ruled that an Alabama ju- uh, law permitting one minute of private prayer or meditation in schools was unconstitutional. In 92, clergy-led prayer at graduation ceremonies was ruled to be unconstitutional. And finally, in 2000, in Santa Fe Independent School District versus Doe, the court ruled that schools are not allowed to permit student-organized, student-led, and student-initiated prayer at football games. Chief Justice Rehnquist, in his dissenting opinion, wrote that the majority opinion bristles with hostility to all things in, uh, to all things religious in public life. But in his uh, dissent in the 1963 The Bible Reading Case, Abington School District versus Shemp, Justice Potter Stewart, writing in the minority, said, and it's not on there, but I'll just read it to you, if religious exercises are held to be an impermissible activity in schools, then religion is placed in an artificial and state-created disadvantage. And a refusal to permit religious exercises thus is seen not as the realization of state neutrality, but rather as the establishment of a religion of secularism, or at least as government support of the beliefs of those who think that religious exercises should be conducted only in private. Stuart is right, by, by curtailing the public exercise of religion, this, the, the court has in recent years advanced the promotion of a different religion, the religion of secularism, which is intolerant of the public exercise of the Christian religion. But even though our religious liberties are under assault by a government that has shown its favor to the intolerant religion of secularism, we still have a lot to be thankful for. For the heritage that we have, the heritage of liberty, for the the rights of liberty that we have derived from God and embedded in our Constitution. Even a large measure of freedom yet today, but even in the face of current challenges, we must be zealous and yet we must also be hopeful in the mercies of God and thankful for the large measure of freedoms that we continue to enjoy, though precariously so. My next presenter is going to lead us in the time of prayer of thanks. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, We thank you for the opportunity to live in this country where we have the freedom to worship you without fear of death. We thank you that you have chosen us to live here in these United States where our founding documents specifically state these freedoms. You have called us as your people and given us the right and the duty to worship you, the only true God. You call us to live out our faith in the midst of the world, bringing the light and saving truth of the gospel. We ask your forgiveness for the times when we do not take advantage of these freedoms and we do not glorify you in our daily actions. We pray for your strength of mind and heart to defend our freedoms when they are threatened and give us courage in in making our voices heard. We pray for your wisdom and guidance as we seek to protect these freedoms and to shine your light among this country and all the nations. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Within the first few pages of the poem Paradise Lost, Satan gloats a speech of exculpation. He hails his exile from God's presence and his entrance into the infernal world with this. Here, at least, we shall be free. In this depiction, at least, Satan's goal and gain is what he calls freedom. Freedom, as the poet Milton realized, is a loaded word with many possible meanings. To a great extent, the standard stories of our own secular society echo the song of Milton, Satan. They see freedom as the ability for self-assertion, for privilege mongering, for control of circumstances, 
and lack of obligation to anyone but oneself. In such a culture, perhaps, the highest function of freedom is release and enablement. Release from anything that binds us, including rules or responsibility to others, and enablement to fulfill our own personal whims. Unsurprisingly, this ideal has ventured into Christian circles. I'll show you what I mean by turning to the great revealer. Google, of course. <laughs> when I do an image search for the phrase Christian freedom, nearly all pictures look like this. Fascinating. According to the great Google, Christian freedom looks an awful lot like an isolated individual. Free. Free from responsibility. Free from difficulty. How shall we navigate this? How shall we talk about freedom as Christians? Thankfully, we aren't the first to wrestle through this. Amnesia is a deadly disease among Christians, for when we do not know our past, we forget our identity. When we do not know where we have been, we do not know where we are, nor where we are going. During the next few moments, then, it's my task to lead us in looking far back. As we look back, even before the founding of our country, we can find immense insight in navigating these complicated waters. Let us alight now upon the life of one profoundly impactful and often overlooked figure, Ambrose of Milan. Ambrose lived in a time when Christianity had been legal and increasingly favored by the Roman government for about 75 years. As Christianity became easier to identify oneself with and increasingly popular as a means for political advancement, it gained increasing numbers of adherents, at least in name. Distortions of essential Christian dogmas were increasingly held with little interest for actual discipleship. Even Roman emperors affiliated themselves in some way with the church, though their character and their actual worldviews were dramatically in contrast with real Christianity. How would Christians respond to this era wisely? How would they live in their newly established freedoms without becoming complacent or distorted in belief or lifestyle? Enter Ambrose the chief pastor, or bishop, as he's known, of the city of Milan, which was the capital at the time of the Roman Empire. The way that Ambrose defended and engaged the Christian notion of freedom not only would ultimately set a pattern that influenced the history of the Western world, but also would set a striking example of responsibility that is a ramification for true freedom. It sounds like a scene from a dramatic film. I would call it Braveheart, but I think that's already been taken. <laughs> In the year 385, the emperor, backed by his formidable military, demanded that Ambrose alter one of the largest churches in Milan so that it would be a place of worship, not for Christians who held to the dogmas of true Christianity, but a place of worship for those who professed Arianism, a popular heresy that denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. Such an action would effectively decommission this building as a church for the worship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it demanded that Ambrose would still be a pastor in this place. It would have been easy for Ambrose to say, as you wish, but he refused and he was called to court for his defiance to the Roman emperor. That day and the following, the emperor showed his might. He stationed his military outside of the churches of Milan, in a way, in a show of intimidation, really, and he sent his officers with decorations for all of the churches of Milan. 
imperial flags. Nevertheless, Ambrose declared the day to be one of worship. He gave every church in Milan hymns and scripture readings that affirmed Christ's true nature as Lord and God. When defending his refusal to submit to the imperial command in court, Ambrose declared that the emperor has no power over the Christian church. He declared this at the end of his defense. Carry me to prison or to death, and I will not resort to violence in response. But I will never betray the truth of the Church of Christ Jesus. I will freely die at the foot of the altar rather than to desert it. The court was so struck by his defense that day that no action was ultimately taken against him. Ambrose knew where no flexibility was to be had. His willingness to stand as a leader against that which was not true about the nature of Christ and to potentially make deep personal sacrifices because of that stand left a legacy for us today. A few years later, Ambrose again was required to stand. A popular charioteer, like the movie stars or major athletes of our own day, was arrested for brutally, committed a, for brutally committing a violent crime in Thessalonica. The masses demanded that the charges be dropped and the charioteer released from prison so that he could race. We don't change. <laughs> a riot even ensued in the city for this cause, ushering in days of local anarchy. The emperor Theodosius heard the news and responded with an outburst of rage and a show of intimidation and brute force. He demanded that a portion of his army enter into Thessalonica and kill, on the spot, anyone apparently involved in the riot. Over 7,000 people were killed in a matter of hours, including many innocent bystanders who were at the wrong place at the wrong time. All as the result of a snap decision made in a fit of anger and an impudent show of force by an insecure emperor. Ambrose heard the news. Remember, he's the head pastor the bishop of the capital city. That very Sunday, Ambrose knew that he would be serving communion. He would be serving communion to Theodosius. Before that could happen, however, Ambrose wrote a series of scathing letters to the emperor. He called the emperor out for acting upon vengeful anger, for valuing a show of violent force over discerning justice, for killing so many so quickly. He told Theodosius that unless he truly considered his actions and repented and took practical steps to ensure such rash actions would be avoided in the future, he would not be given communion, nor in fact would he be welcome to enter into the doors of the Christian church that Sunday. Now let's review for a minute. Ambrose might be the Bishop of Milan, but he's writing to the Emperor of the Roman Empire. Ambrose was under no legal obligation to respond to the Emperor's heinous crime. Ambrose could have pretended nothing had happened. Ambrose could have simply attended to other matters. It would have been safer. Ambrose was free, and yet he defined his Christian freedom differently. He saw his Christian freedom as involving the weight of responsibility. He saw his identity in terms of active accountability unto his God. Here's an excerpt from one of the letters that Ambrose wrote to the emperor that week. Am I to be silent? This would be the worst choice of all, for then my conscience would be bound, my liberty of speech taken away. What then of the scripture that says, if the priest does not warn the wicked from his wicked way, the wicked man shall die in his iniquity? It seems to say that the servant of God is also liable 
when this servant does not warn the wicked. This I have written, not to challenge you, O emperor, but that it may induce you to put away this sin from your reign. <coughs> the emperor could have responded to Ambrose with exile. <laughs> he could have trumped up charges and had Ambrose killed. Yet what happened was striking. The emperor repented, genuinely. And he created new legal measures to protect cities and individuals from rash outbursts of anger from emperors in the future. Twice then, Ambrose stood against the prevailing powers in standing against decisions that directly countered the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ambrose did so because he had a position of influence, and he recognized that when Christians speak of freedom, we speak of a freedom from the reign of sin, including our own complacent desire for self-fulfillment, including freedom from our complacency. And instead, we talk about a dynamic, mature, free participation that we have in Christ. This is a costly freedom, one that we did not pay for, one that Christ gives us. Our freedom is in his grip. Thus Paul warned the church of Galatia, you were called unto freedom, brothers and sisters. Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. We are not free unto ourselves, Paul realized. We are free unto Christ. This reality, Ambrose knew full well, has changed and will continue to change the world. Unlike Milton's Satan, and unlike the world's myopic notions of freedom today, Ambrose operated with a sense of responsibility. Were it not for Ambrose, in many ways, I think the world really would be a different place. Not only did he set an example for Christian leaders to call the government to its limits, to call the government to accountability, but also to call out wrongs and offer another path, to stand in for the truth that is Christ Jesus. And he knew the impact of teaching and mentoring on the world as well. <clears throat> if it were not for his discipleship of a bright young man who came to him full of questions about God and the world, we would have never had the giant among theologians of the church St. Augustine, whose writings and ideas, including just warfare, are still with us today, still quoted by theologians and pastors around the world. Ambrose discipled and mentored Augustine. Hear me on this. I do not claim that Ambrose was without complicated examples of his own humanity. This is the case for all who have come before us. Humans are not saints by their own merit but by the grace of God and the wisdom that he gives. But, unlike Am but like Ambrose, we live in a political climate that can be very challenging. There are many who do more damage than good, many who distort truth, and many who complacently waste their freedom, rather than see freedom as an incredible gift with incredible binding responsibility. We realize, along with Ambrose, that Christ's freedom binds us and calls us to difficult tasks and costly truths. Like Ambrose, we are called to lead and minister in this world. This is world changing. It is Christ our Lord who changes his world. He changes his world through his people. May we, like Ambrose, leave a legacy for those who come after us. In Christ, may we impact the world. Hi, let's pray for the role of Christianity throughout the world. Father God, we come to you as people who know that freedom is not free. We know that all true wisdom comes from you and all good direction comes from you and that we can do nothing on our own without that. So we pray for those believers, for the church, for the saints here 
on this campus, in our city, in our country, throughout the world, that you would give us direction, not just in words, but in actions as well, as we reach out to continue pre protecting the life of those who cannot speak for themselves in other countries, here, the unborn. Give us direction in promoting freedom in other countries where people cannot speak or stand up for themselves because of the dictators. Help us to seek your wisdom in how to speak in those countries, in how to bring resolve to those that are struggling. We ask for wisdom in abolishing slavery here in our country, here in our city, across the world. Again, not just with words, but with actions as well, with wisdom that can only come from you. We know Satan is creative and he's sneaky, but you have more insight than we do. We pray for the tools that are necessary to continue to build the hospitals and the health centers around the country, around the world, Lord, to bring compassion to those that are hurting, to share the good news and the hope that can only come through you, Lord. We pray that you rise up people that are able and willing to take on that fight, because it is a fight, and that cause. Give them strength, give them the tools they need, help rear up support here in our states to help those across the world. We pray too for our schools that are still providing education that is biblically based, not just here in the United States, but in other countries as well. We ask for your protection. We ask for your support. We ask for people to rise up, to continue to give them the support that they need, and for people to be able to go there in those countries and here in our own country and feel safe and free to worship. We ask that your beauty continues to be spread from everybody in the church, um, not just through art, but through literature and design as well. And even though we are seeing some things that are beginning to erode in our country, that we will not sit by silently. We ask for scientific discovery to continue, that you will allow um, believers that are scientists to stand up and create opportunities that will benefit and not destroy what you have created. And I pray for the protection of the saints around the world, Lord. You give us protection. We know the history of those who have stood up for you, Lord. But we also know that your word is stronger than any word of the people that hate you. The person who runs amok, your word is strong and your word stands. Thank you, Father. And amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Norton, and I am uh, currently senior counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. I've had the honor and privilege of being with Alliance Defending Freedom for almost five years, and uh, I'm just uh, so blessed uh, by God to be here and a part of this Religious Liberties Summit uh, this morning. Uh, Everything that's been said so far, I would agree with, and I want to just say to you that because of the focus of uh, the threat and assault on religious liberties in Colorado, after the first of the year, I'll be launching a different organization called Colorado Freedom Institute to focus on uh, religious liberties attacks here in Colorado and states nearby Colorado. I cannot uh, tell you how uh, much I agree with the idea that never before in the history of this country has the idea of religious freedom and religious liberty in our churches, in our military, in our schools, uh, in the public arena been under attack. Uh, people in very powerful positions uh, seek to silence and marginalize people of faith, particularly followers of Jesus. Uh, what they say is that we have the freedom to worship and you actually heard Senator Stedman refer to this concept of freedom uh, of worship during the video that was played before. What that means is you have the right to pray inside the four walls of your home, inside your church, in your synagogue, in your mosque, wherever it might be, but don't you dare take your religion into the marketplace. Don't you dare try to affect uh, uh, public policy uh, uh, by the, on the basis of any of your uh, uh, faith beliefs or views. Uh, you just simply are not welcome there, and they're doing all they can to silence and marginalize us in this effort. 
Uh, we've seen a sea change of attitude over the last uh, 50 years or so. I don't think anyone was, uh, anyone was greater, however, than the June 26, uh, 20, uh, 2015 marriage decision by the United States Supreme Court, the Obergefell decision. And you probably know the United States Constitution says absolutely nothing about marriage. It has traditionally been left to the states, even Justice Kennedy said so in a decision two years ago, that this is an issue of concern uh, for states to deal with. And 31 states, including Colorado, had adopted uh, constitutional or other statutory provisions uh, providing that marriage is the union of one man and one woman and no other marriage is valid or recognized uh, in, in the state of Colorado. Every society in the history of mankind has valued the marriage of one man and one woman, and for very simple reasons. It's the best societal unit in the history of the world to uh, procreate, raise, and educate children, and it also is in the best interest of both the husband and the wife. It doesn't really matter if you believe that as a matter of faith. It's a matter of secular reality that the, the marriage of one man and one woman is in the best interest of every society in the history of the world. And yet on June 26, 2015, Justice Kennedy, writing for uh, five justices uh, in the majority in the Obergefell decision, wrote this. He said, our founding fathers did not presume to know the extent of freedom in all of its dimensions, and so the Supreme Court has been entrusted to define liberty as we learn its meaning. How incredible of a statement is that? John Adams is actually even rolling in his grave as I speak this at this moment. So is Thomas Jefferson. There is, said Kennedy, no lawful basis for a state to refuse to recognize a lawful same-sex marriage performed in another state on the grounds of its same-sex marriage. That changed the world in the United States overnight. Chief Justice Roberts, in a stinging and stirring dissent, said, just who do we think we are? Amen, is right. Justice Scalia, who you all were privileged to hear from a few months ago uh, in, in, uh, at CCU, raised the specter that this decision marked the end of democracy as we know it. Justice Alito warned that homosexual forces that wish to smash all dissent from their LGBTQ agenda and orthodoxy will do all they can to use the Supreme Court's decision to marginalize and persecute those who believe in biblical teaching. And the obvious problem with what was written is that it does not recognize the First Amendment right of people to exercise their religion. Exercise is calls for action. It is not simply taking place within the four walls of your home or your church. Justice Thomas wrote that this decision threatens religious liberty our nation has long sought to protect. Just a few days after that decision, uh, James Obergefell, one of the plaintiffs in the case, said, this decision does not go far enough. More is to come. And you have seen the fruits of what has come and is to come more. We heard from uh, Justice Kennedy on October 29, the same Justice Kennedy who wrote the majority decision in Obergefell said that uh, at a Harvard Law School uh, presentation that government employees with a religious convictions about marriage should resign. He said that if a public official has a moral objection to homosexuality or to abortion, she must either follow the law or quit public service. He went on to say, stunning his audience, some judges did the right thing and resigned under Hitler's Third Reich. Christians are bound to follow the law, even if it is morally corrupt. Francis Schaeffer, also turning in his grave, 50 years ago he wrote that any government that commands what contradicts God's law abrogates its authority. It is no longer our proper legal government. And at that point, we have the right and the duty to disobey it. I want to tell you about a man who has been held accountable for disobeying, disobeying man's law. Uh, he is a guest with us today, and we are honored by his presence. He is my friend and Alliance Defending Freedom client, uh, Jack Phillips, Masterpiece Cake Shop. I don't know how many of you have read the story of Jack Phillips, but at a time when 
the, the Colorado Constitution provided that marriage was the union of one man and one woman. A, a gay male couple came into Jack's uh, Masterpiece Cake Shop, which is on South Wadsworth near Hamden. I'd encourage you to buy some uh, bakery products from my friend Jack Phillips. He could use your support. Uh, two men came in and asked him to bake a wedding cake to help them celebrate uh, the wedding that they had uh, just simply uh, recently celebrated in the state of Massachusetts where gay marriage was legal but still not legal in Colorado. Jack said, you know, I'll bake you anything that you want. I'll make anything that you want, but I can't, as a matter of faith, as a follower of Jesus, uh, bake a wedding cake for you. This whole encounter took uh, two minutes uh, or three minutes, perhaps, at the maximum. These men left, and a few days later, they filed a complaint with the Colorado Commission on Civil Rights. And um, in finding that Jack had violated the Colorado uh, Public Accommodation Statute, uh, one member of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission called freedom of religion, quote, a despicable piece of rhetoric, and compared Jack's religious beliefs to those of slave owners and Nazi perpetrators of the Holocaust. Jack's bakery business has suffered financially, and I want to invite him up now to tell you the rest of the story of what he has been threatened with and where his case stands. Jack, please come up and say hello to this crowd. So tell us, Jack, how'd you come to uh, faith in Jesus Christ? Uh, how did you come to a faith in Jesus Christ? Excuse me. Um, thank you, Michael. I appreciate all you've done. Um, about uh, 1979, I was working in a bakery and uh, been married and I had two kids. And I was driving home, and uh, God had the audacity to come into my car <laughs> and convict me of my sin. And I don't mean just, you know, I lied on Thursday. Okay, no. He convicted me that I was a liar. That's why I lied. That I was a sinner, and that's why I sinned. And that I needed salvation and that would only come through Jesus Christ, his son. And I'd heard that before, and I knew that was correct, and I said, you're right. Let me uh, clean up my act, and you'll get a better deal. He said, you can't. You're right, I'm yours. And life has been radically different ever since then. Um, I told my wife about my decision, fully expecting her to leave. <laughs> because three weeks earlier, my sister-in-law had just invited her to church, nothing more. And my wife totally blew up. If I was my sister-in-law, I'd never invite her to church again. I didn't invite anybody to church again. She was so mean. But I told my wife that I'd become a Christian, and she said, me too. Three days ago, now we have something in common. So, from here on, you know, we tried our best to live our lives in honoring Jesus Christ, raising our kids that way. We now have three kids. Um, I have two older brothers, two older sisters. All of them have been married to the same spouses, their respective spouses, for over 40 years. I'm the baby. Um, I've only been married 37 years. <laughs> My uh, dad died about five months before their 50th anniversary. So that's my experience with marriage. I, that's what God designed. One man, one woman for life. So, Jack, Jack tell uh, us how you uh, came to uh, name your cake shop Masterpiece Cake Shop. What's the significance of the word masterpiece in that, uh, in that name? Uh, a couple things. One is it's artwork. It's, uh, we do art on cakes, but the uh, main thing is, in my mind, every time I write masterpiece, I know 
that no man can serve two masters. He will either love the one and hate the other, or despise one and give his allegiance to the other. Now, now Jack, after this incident of, of these two men that came in to order the, the wedding cake, you went through a hearing before the uh, Colorado um, Civil Rights Commission. And uh, tell the, tell the uh, men and women that are gathered here uh, what it is you have been ordered to do as a result of uh, what was found to be discrimination. Um, I'm required to change my policy and start creating cakes for same-sex couples. Um, I'm, uh, to retrain my staff and to report to the commission four times a year for two years um, to advise him of my progress in my rehabilitation and um, let them know of any any reason why I've turned down any cake for any anybody. Since this occasion and since this uh, challenge uh, to you, have, what what have you done with regard to orders for wedding cakes in your in your masterpiece cake shop? Uh, about a year ago, we decided that we were not going to take orders for wedding cakes right now until this is all settled through the courts, so I don't have to, you know, avoid that. I can avoid that issue. Um, but that does take, um, yeah, like maybe 40% of our income away, so. This has been a huge blow uh, to uh, Jack and to Masterpiece Cake Shop e economically, as you can imagine. I know you all know, uh, those of you that have gone through uh, weddings and ordering wedding cakes, that they're quite expensive uh, to create and, and to produce. And Jack has passed up, uh, I don't know, six, 70 or 80 orders for wedding cakes as a result. Hundreds. Maybe more, hundreds, hundreds of orders for wedding cakes. So you can just imagine the impact. Right now, Jack's case is on appeal to the Colorado Supreme Court. Uh, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom represents Jack uh, at, at this level. Uh, we had a hearing before the Colorado Court of Appeals a couple of months ago uh, where the Colorado Court of Appeals panel affirmed the Commission of uh, Civil Rights Commission's uh, decision. And we have recently uh, filed uh, petitions for, it's called Petitions for Written of Certiorari to the Colorado Supreme Court. And the case is now uh, in, uh, in briefing uh, stage before the Colorado Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know how this is going to come out, uh, but you uh, know uh, that prayer is powerful and prayer is effective, and I would just encourage you to pray for Jack Phillips, uh, for his wife, by the way, has had some health issues during this course of this time as well with all the pressure going on, and to pray for uh, God to divinely intervene with the uh, Colorado Supreme Court to bring about a just result, a just result that honors God and that honors uh, Jack's faith to God. And Jack, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Thank you. So, so I think I have about uh, five minutes left. Am I correct about that? Uh, okay, I got about five minutes left. I'm just going to tell you what's. Ten minutes, okay. Uh, just going to tell you that what's happening to Jack Phillips is happening all over the country, uh, right, right at this very time in our in our society. A uh, number of organizations, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, Liberty Institute, you heard, is um, representing the coach. Uh, it's a very good organization based in Texas. And other allies, uh, uh, including hopefully Colorado Freedom Institute after the first of the year, will pick up the cudgel and, and fight and fight and fight and fight over and over and over again, win or lose, until, we, uh, until either the Lord comes or uh, the uh, issues uh, uh, swing back uh, to the way God had intended them to. In the, in the state of Washington, uh, we represent a client named Baron L. Stutzman, who was a florist, very similar to Jack's situation to Jack, uh, where uh, she, would, she actually had uh, friends who were a gay couple, and they came in after 20 years of buying flowers from her and ordered uh, a flower, her to create, asked her to create flowers for their same-sex wedding. She declined to do so. She has virtually lost everything she owns over this uh, this this dispute. Uh, Melissa Klein in Oregon, perhaps have heard of uh, Sweet Cakes by Melissa. Uh, she likewise refused to uh, bake a wedding cake uh, for a same-sex couple on the basis of her faith uh, in Jesus Christ. She has been fined $135,000, and when people um, uh, put together uh, a GoFundMe account where they could make donations to help her, uh, the administrative law judge ordered her to discontinue that and ordered her not to be able to use the funds to pay pay her fine. Uh, this is how vi uh, just vicious uh, these folks seem to be. 
Kelvin Cochran, fire chief of Atlanta, a black man uh, with strong Christian faith, wrote a book on his private time uh, about his faith and said in his book, among other things, that uh, black families were um, being deprived uh, of fathers uh, in their families, and one of the reasons was that there was a lack of faith in Jesus Christ. He got fired for writing that book on his private time and for expressing those views. Many of you know about the HHS contraceptive mandate, a requirement uh, for uh, Colorado Christian University and private businesses and others to include in their health insurance coverage of abortifacients and contraceptives, and many people are fighting that. CCU has successfully fought that uh, to this point in time and before the Supreme Court. Uh, right now, our cases involving uh, Little Sisters of the Poor and seven or eight other cases that are uh, before the United States Supreme Court, and I think hopefully will successfully resolve in favor of CCU and those other uh, organizations that uh, have uh, both religious nonprofits and for profit, religiously motivated for profits organizations that are resisting that. There are challenges to uh, tax status of religious organizations. I think this is going to be the next great battle, uh, other than this uh, uh, gay rights issue that I think is overarching everything. This will be the next great battle is challenges to uh, tax exemptions, uh, 501c3 tax exemptions of um, faith based organizations. Employment discrimination charges. Those are uh, coming about uh, fast and furious around the country uh, uh, and uh, compliance with Title IX and other regulations uh, opening up uh, uh, bathrooms and locker rooms and other private uh, facilities to anybody who uh, believes uh, of the moment uh, that he is a female or she is a male uh, to be able to use whatever facility that person wants to. Threats to chaplains, both military and, uh, and college and high school chaplains. Uh, the threats, by the way, are <laughs> incredibly limited to people who uh, follow Jesus. Uh, they are not uh, universal threats. Uh, it's just amazing to me how people are so worried about uh, a Bible uh, sitting on a teacher's desk as though something may jump out of that Bible, and I pray God it does, uh, <laughs> and, and affect uh, the people that are sitting uh, next to or around or opposite uh, from that Bible. And uh, on and on and on and on, I could tell you what, uh, we, what we are uh, faced with and what we were dealing with in, in those organizations like mine, uh, Alliance Defending Freedom, Liberty Institute, and others that uh, are doing the best we can to defend people of faith uh, in the courts, in the marketplace, in the public square. How do followers of Jesus respond? And I want to just concur with everything I've heard so far. Followers of Jesus should not have to sacrifice religious freedom. But there is no question about it that that freedom is totally under assault. But if we fail to take a stand, if you fail to do anything, if you remain silent, uh, we will lose the liberty that our founders uh, fought and shed blood over and that our, uh, and our military over the years have fought and shed blood over. So I just encourage you to uh, hear and do uh, what it is that uh, Jesus commands you to do. The gospel of Jesus Christ is arena language. It is go, do, make, create, uh, witness. Do all the things that Jesus uh, has told you to do and do it faithfully. It doesn't say sit down, be silent, wait and see what happens. It says go and do. May it be said of us, each and every one of us in this room, that we did go, we did do, we did act, we did speak, and we spoke clearly with the gospel uh, to the most pressing issues of our day. Thank you very much for this conference. Thank you, President Armstrong, and may God bless you all. Thank you very much. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we pray against the threat of declining religious freedom. We pray for leaders. We pray for the Supreme Courts. Lord God, we pray for all of those um, making decisions. Father, this morning I want to pray specifically for Joe and for Jack. And I thank you for their courage and boldness, Lord God. And I pray that you would be with them, you would be with those that are assisting them. Lord God, we lift them up to you. Protect us, Lord God, as was said this morning, from being angry or discouraged. Give us the courage, boldness, wisdom, and discernment. Lord God, help us to uh, be courageous. Help us to know when to speak, when to remain silent, Lord God, but to defend you. Thank you again, and we do trust that you win. In your name, amen.
Good morning. Is this on? Excellent. Good morning. I'm Krista Kafer. I am a professor here of communications. I'm also a member of the media, which I think makes me like a little bit evil. <laughs> Just a little bit. As this is Jeff Hunt, he's the new head of Centennial Institute here at uh, CCU. He's also a little bit involved with the media. He is the founder of Avanova Media, yeah. which makes you a little bit evil as well. <laughs> so we're going to be talking a little bit about media bias. You know, um, there was a great tragedy that happened earlier this week, a horrible shooting in San Bernardino. They're still looking into the motives of the killer, but uh, as tweets went out, tweets saying, we need prayer, we need this. Basically, a lot of Republicans, a lot of Christians were saying, please, you know, please pray for these people. Please, please pray for who, those who were injured. Please pray for those who were, uh, you know, uh, who have lost, uh, who have lost loved ones. Meanwhile, people on the other side were tweeting things about gun control, as is their right. But then the New York Daily News puts out this headline the very next day. God isn't fixing this. And I know it's hard to read from where you're sitting, but it's got three different screenshots of tweets from four Republicans. They are Cruz, Graham, Ryan, and Paul, each calling for prayer. Then after this headline comes out, the Twitter shaming begins. And you have people like Marcos Molitas, he's the founder of Daily Cause, which I'm sure you read regularly. This is the uh, liberal blog um, saying that, uh, you know, would your prayers bring back the dead? Then you have Washington Post columnist Gene Weingarten saying uh, that people who are praying should shut up, that they are in fact part of the problem. Then you've got the, N the NBC Nightly News, and uh, this would be uh, their correspondent, Andrea Mitchell. She's lamenting the lack of Democrat gun control pro proposals going forward, and she quotes liberal blogger Igor Volensky, who set off a tweet storm calling for lawmakers who offer prayers but oppose new gun laws, pointing out how much money they get from the NRA. The Washington Post, not to be undone, says, or outdone, says, other countries must have fewer mass shootings because their conservative politicians offer threats and prayers more vigorously. The Guardian, full-on left paper from England, says, if there were something that politicians could offer other than thoughts and prayers to stop gun violence. And of course, the Huffington Post says, another mass shooting, another del deluge of tweeted prayers. The Nation then takes a, a screenshot of tweets from Hillary Clinton and Martin O'Malley and how they're calling for real action and then tweets from Republicans calling for thoughts and prayers, and then writes the simple post, compare and contrast. Of course, you know that this is a classical fallacy. Either you pray or you act. Either you, you, know, you put out sort of empty statements to an empty universe, or you actually do something. Now this, of course, is the classical black and white fallacy, but it's also an oversimplification of what prayer is and what action is, because every Christian believes not only in prayer, but in doing. Now these are not the only examples. We've got some other examples of media bias as well. Yeah. Go, go to the microphone. Oh, this one? This one's hot? Better? OK. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> So I'm going to, we did a kind of survey, and what um, Chris is hitting on is exactly right, is this kind of notion of fallacies. They don't really address the issue of religious freedom at all. They don't respect it. They placate either the issue that religious freedom is trying to address, or they just dismiss religious freedom altogether. So we'll go to the next one, which is John Stewart. It's been a while since I've taken the SATs, but I believe the formulation as you defend yourselves is this. The lesbian couple is to Christian businesses as KKK members are to everyone else. Um, and so they just kind of, they absolutely ridicule the issue that Jack's even facing right now. Um, we'll go to the next one which says, uh, this is Salon, and Rand Paul is actually trying to defend religious freedom. John Stewart blasts Rand Paul's disingenuous stance on religious freedom. Do they sell cakes to sinners all the time? <laughs> so rather than actually dealing with the issue of religious freedom, they try to do a logical fallacy on that. We'll go to another Salon article. This has to do with Hobby Lobby, and please forgive the language in this one. 
Hobby Lobby was able to impose its oppressive viewpoints on employees who simply want to do the right thing for themselves and their families. The anti-choice movement is rotten to its seedy core. The movement since its inception has been built on a lie that is about life when it's clearly a movement about religious prudes who want to sneer at women they think are, I'm not even going to say that word. So um, uh, let's go to the next one. Another example, the Des Moines Register. The threat to religious liberty is real, but it's not from the LGBTQ community, women's reproductive advocates, public education leaders, the courts, or minority <laughs> religious traditions, as the religious right would have us believe. The threat to religious liberty in our community is from the very people who are making the most noise about it, religious right zealots. Uh, Chicago Sun-Times, April 1st editorial claimed the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was driven hard by anti-gay sentiments, the work of social conservatives who are living in the past. Um, do you want to talk about some more examples? Yes, I, you know, it's hard to call out just a few examples, but uh, most recently, Sally Cohn, she wrote for the Daily Beast, that um, you know, basically conflating fundamentalist jihadists with fundamentalist Christians. Do I need to remind her that when a Muslim goes extreme, he blows himself up? When a Christian goes extreme, she starts a Bible study. There is a difference, okay? There is a difference. Um, you know, you think about uh, Tim Tebow, uh, CBS, uh, I guess, just sort of joined the little mock fest against T Tim Tebow. He'd broken up with his girlfriend because apparently she wanted to get busy and he wanted to wait for marriage. And so, am I allowed? I'm not allowed to say get busy, right? Okay, so um, anyway, forgive me. Can, can we scratch that from the record? But um, so, and then, the da of course, the New, New York Daily, uh, the New York Daily News uh, then goes on to make fun of Tim Tebow and saying things like, you know, uh, it's not that he can't get into the NFL. There's other things he can't seem to get into as well. Um, we've got, you know, we can find specific examples. It's pretty obvious that media bias does exist. In fact, I would say it exists in the small rather than the big. Often it's just word choice. You think about the times they say things like, evangelicals oppose rights for gays. I don't oppose rights for anyone. Our rights are God-given. I don't, I, don't, I don't oppose rights for anyone. What I oppose is the degenderification of marriage. What I oppose is boys, however pained and suffering because they feel like they should be girls, going into the girls' locker room or the girls' bathroom. I think that gender matters. I don't oppose rights. So the, the sort of imp, you know the sort of oversimplification of these things. But bias exists. I'd say it's more influential, gaining influence because of some trends in the media, which I'll go over, and then I'll talk about what we can do about it. So why is there media bias? I do know for a fact, at least I can make a pretty good prediction, that Bill Maher wakes up every day and thinks to himself, I wonder how I can diss Christians. I bet there's a way I can make fun of them. And he's done an excellent job at it, whether it be his awful movie or the things that he says about Christians. But the average journalist, and in fact the average commentator, and of course they're different, journalist is out there writing a story, trying reasonably to be broadly based, and of course a commentator, and I am a commentator on radio as in the paper, um, I'm giving my opinion. So when a columnist gives his or her opinion, however outlandish it may be, that's actually okay, that's what they do. When a journalist imports their bias into their article, it's not okay. And they know it's not okay. And I think most of them reasonably do try to avoid that bias, but you can't always see what is blind to you. And I think a lot of secular journalists think that religion is either a hobby, you know, that's that quaint little thing you do on, you know, Sunday, and maybe you got a goofy Bible study, and you, you know, you eat cookies, and you talk about God, and it's fine. That's your hobby. Or they see it as a sort of old-fashioned worldview, a worldview that they kind of resent because you're kind of in the way of good gun control policies, and you're kind of in the way of, you know, gay rights, and you're kind of in the way of women's rights. But they just see it as sort of your old-fashioned world view. And those are their biases that they come to the table with, and they don't even really think about it. They just influences their writing. Now, there are trends in media that are shaking things up right now. I'm still old-fashioned. I read my Wall Street Journal every day in the paper with my coffee. I share that with my students. 
They looked blankly at me, like, what's a paper, <laughs> right? But I, so I read the paper, I read the Denver Post every day. I deliberately want, read one paper with a right slant and one with a left slant. And um, I do this, well, papers are going digital. I suspect that in due time, I will be reading simply a digital version of all of those. The interesting thing about the digital version is that they're going to start, they, they, Im, they sort of embed these tweets, Facebook posts, audio from TV, from radio, from people's cell phones, from alternative media, Blogs are incorporating things from traditional news. News is including things from traditional blogs. I'm on the radio every day, one to four, 710 KNUS, please tune in, get the app. And I, uh, you know, we, we, we run articles on our website, 710KNUS.com, and also on our app, we do tweeting, we do different things, right? We are embedding and mixing these things up. So I think we're going to see a lot more blended media, things that are blended, which means that if we go back to that initial example with the daily news, they took tweets, put them on their front page, and then made fun of them, right? So when you tweet something, it could end up somewhere that you didn't intend it to, right? So there is this sort of blending. So the bias of, say, some of these, uh, like when I was looking at different articles, the bias of some of these outlandish comedians that say things about Christians, you know, go pray to your God while we do real stuff about gun violence, that then shows up on blogs. It even shows up in news articles. I read a, a really interesting piece by The Econ or not The Economist, The, uh, the Atlantic, which is it's a really, it's a good, pretty good magazine, um, about this Twitter shaming. I mean, it is, if you are biased, you are now sort of gaining exposure for your bias. So there is that blending. There's also, I would say, an erosion of the center. And it, it's not the first time. I mean, people will tell you that papers used to be very partisan in the 19th century. So it's not a new thing. But it's interesting to me that CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC all used to be very similar when cable news started off. That is shocking to us today because now MSNBC and its 12 watchers are on the far, far left. I would say CNN is sort of center left and Fox is center right. I watch both. I appreciate different things about them. But there is a kind of erosion of the center. And what that contributes to is confirmation bias, which means that people are going only to those sources with which they, do, they agree that can solidify what they already believe. So the average liberal gets up in the morning, maybe glance, if they're on the far left, they're going to glance at the Daily Cause, they're going to watch MSNBC, they might tune in to NPR, even though it's a little to the right of them, right? The average moderate liberal is going to watch, listen to NPR and is probably going to read the New York Times. The average conservative watch Fox News and read the Wall Street Journal. I would say this is actually a bad thing. And for all of you out there, I would encourage you to watch both CNN and Fox News. Read a paper on the right, a paper on the left, because confirmation bias can affect us as well. But it also means that people are really limiting, they're really sort of siloing. I also tell my students, you have to get out into the world. You cannot live in a silo. You cannot limit your exposure to other people because people are going to be limiting their own exposure, right? That secular friend is not going to seek out, it's not going to read World Magazine. They're not going to go to a church. They're not going to seek out, unless they're in a seeking phase, they're not going to look for it. They're going to watch Jon Stewart, they're going to read, you're going to watch, you know, read the Huff Post. They might watch BuzzFeed, right? I watch BuzzFeed, look at addiction to animal videos, but it's okay, we could talk about that later. But people are siloing and it contributes to that, that confirmation bias. Um, so I would say there's two things that we can do as Christians to combat media bias. Interaction is one and prudence is the other. I'll start with prudence because we are in an age in which we must go with the, um, there's, there's a line in the Bible, and I'm really bad at citing scripture, so I'm sure all of you will know the citation, but that we must be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. So we need to be innocent in our own behavior. We need to be clear conscienced, but we must be shrewd. When we tap off with some crazy tweet because we're mad, Someone's going to pick that up and they're going to use it against us. There is an Arvada legislator who is now two, two Arvada legislators or two legislators in general in two minutes <laughs> that are uh, going to be recalled because of things they said. So you need to be prudent. You also need to interact with the press, both in terms of your consumption, but also in terms of 
We need, as an institution, to be pushing out our speakers. We need to be interacting with the, with the press because it's very hard to stereotype people you already know, right? And one of the things that I appreciate about what Jeff Hunt and uh, the Centennial Institute, as well as Avanova, have done is they push out, literally be a resource for the press. And tell us a little bit about how you do that. Yeah, uh, we, we basically want to take advantage of the news cycles. So um, the way that uh, Krista is going to operate at KNUS is they're going to wake up and they're going to look at the newspapers and they're going to look for people that can comment on the news and be experts on that. Um, we sought to disrupt that um, and push our experts to be the experts that the news media spoke to. And so uh, in the last year, we've done 250 interviews with um, scholars from the Centennial Institute on issues um, that could pop up from life, marriage, religious freedom, the economy, energy, education reform, whatever it is, we want our experts to be the people driving the conversation, the agenda, and not just be consumers or critics critiquers or those types of things. And that's that's what we've been doing on the media booking side of stuff. Excellent. And I see opportunities for CCU as an institution to do that. I mean, if we know a big education report is coming out of the state, why shouldn't our dean of education say, hey, I want to be a resource to you. Here's a press statement on that, but I also want to be a resource. If you'd like some background, let us help you out. That when you become friends with these people, you become a lot more influential. And I want to end with just a really great quote, and that is John Quincy Adams. I put this this little quote on my door at the uh, Heritage Foundation when I worked there, because I used to feel really down about the nut nutty stuff that was going on on Capitol Hill. And so I, I put this on there to remind myself that the result, that, that the duty is ours and the results belong to God. I don't think Quincy, uh, John Quincy Adams could have said it any better than that. Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity today to focus on this subject. Father, it touches all of us in many, many ways, and we know that one way that we are influenced is through the media. So Father, um, first and foremost, I pray for those in the media who do not know you. Father, that you would bring people into their lives that would share your good news and gospel. Father, we pray for their salvation. And Father, we pray for those in the media who do understand the importance of religious liberty and do understand um, the perspective of Christians. And I pray that they will continue in their support for our religious liberties I pray that you will continue to give them opportunities and boldness. And Father, I pray for their protection as they do those things. And Father, I pray for each one of us in this room and um, Christians around the world. Father, I pray that we will not be the audience that Mike Norton speaks of that does nothing. Father, I pray that we will speak. Father, that we will act. Father, that we will do those things that influence, and those things that bring honor and glory to your name. And Father, I pray that you will continue to raise up men and women who have a desire to participate as media representatives and those that love you and desire to serve you. And Father, I pray that you will continue to bring men and women into this media pool that seek to honor and glorify you. And I pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Sherling. Well, as we uh, come to kind of the home stretch here and bring this to a close, actually, I want to comment on the Tim Tebow case. If, uh, if you saw the statement from the Tebow folks, they never had even dated that the story was put out uh, because she tweeted about something being something good being withheld. They coupled that together with the Tebow thing and put out a story that he had withheld uh, his, his uh, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so it's totally fabricated, um, uh, which is kind of interesting. Well, we want to just do a quick overview. You've heard a few tips 
uh, from Mike Norton and, and from Krista and Jeff about uh, what we're doing uh, about this issue. And the president has pledged that this is going to be an ongoing conversation here, and some of these other tips will, will come out. But a couple things that I would just encourage you to think about. The first one is know this issue. Be well read. Uh, many times uh, I run across Christians who are not well read on the issue. They heard kind of something about it. And when you say, well, what do you think about that? It's like, yeah, yeah I heard something about that. But they're not well read on the issues uh, of culture at all. Uh, many of them just kind of bunker up and get their day-to-day -day life going, and they just don't reach out to some of these issues. If you don't read World Magazine, uh, I have found that to be a, a great resource uh, for me um, to kind of get some of these issues out in front. But find something that feeds you on this issue and many other cultural issues that you can keep up with the issue, keep the conversation going there. Be active on the issue. I wonder how many of us, I know I would if I would have had a son on the Bremerton High School football team, <laughs> I would have been at the school board meeting. But I wonder how many of us who didn't have a football dog in the hunt would have gone to say something to the school board about what was going on uh, with the coach. Be active on the issue. One of the interesting things, Dr. Deb Scheffel and the education faculty just uh, had an um, event on Tuesday where they uh, kind of thanked and recognized the six graduates that are graduating here in December from the School of Education. And they brought in, and I hope this doesn't sound bad, but they, they brought in just kind of an average teacher from Douglas County to speak. He knew everything that he could do. He knew all the case law that was out there about how he could exude his Christianity in his job as a teacher. And that's what he spoke to this, this group about. I can do this. I can do this. I can do that. He knew exactly what he could and couldn't do in his role as a teacher. And what was amazing is some of it was pretty effusive about what he could do um, in his Christianity as a teacher. And I was impressed by the fact that a guy who just teaches middle school knew exactly what he could do in terms of his Christianity. He had story after story about little things that he had done that had brought students to him um, about the issue. We're going to talk about what you can do uh, in your churches uh, here. Uh, Paul Eldridge is going to talk about what he's doing uh, down in his church uh, right now. But what can you do in your churches to uh, make sure that they are covered in some of these issues that Paul's going to talk about? Step forward when there's an issue. When you hear something that is happening around you, be the one that steps forward. Be the one that is the catalyst. Um, to use a, a great term, be the community organizer, if you got that, of the people around you uh, against, this, against an issue. Be vocal within your sphere of influence. Uh, many of us don't even know who our representatives are. Who are they? Are they do you have their emails? Uh, is this something that you do regularly when you hear things that are happening in the culture, especially as they consider laws down at the state capitol or nationally. Are you one of those voices uh, that, is, that is there? And then obviously the, the biggest thing to, to cover all this is that God is in control here. We know that, that he is going to win on this issue, that he has some kind of pattern, uh, some kind of plan for this issue that we can't even think about right now. But a student this week uh, wrote me a note and included this Psalms 33, 20 through 22 verse in it. And I appreciated it so much, I wanted to share it with you. We wait in the hope of the Lord. He is our help and shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Our hope is in the Lord. That's what changes the game uh, for all of this, is that we have the ultimate hope. We know how it ends. Um, but now uh, we have to be living worthy of that hope as we go forward to be active and to be up on the issue. Paul Eldridge is going to come and, and pray for us uh, in this area, but we also wanted Paul to uh, give us a little bit about what he's doing on the board of his church in terms of some of these issues. Paul, come share with us that. Thank you, Jim. Uh, our family attends West Bowl Community Church. Uh, we have uh, attended there since we moved to Colorado about four and a half years ago. And in June, I was uh, nominated, elected to become an elder on the board at, at West Bowl Community Church. And of course, my 11-year-old looked at me and said, Dad, don't you have to be old to do that? So that was kind of a neat context because she doesn't perceive me as being old enough to be an elder. Actually, I don't perceive myself to be old enough to be an elder as well. Um, 
In uh, late summer, I don't know if it was August or September, Dan Coor sent a, a fascinating, uh, it wasn't even really an article, it was a paper written by the DeMoss Group, a, a national PR firm out of Atlanta, and it was all about how do churches and Christian ministries manage, as a result of this June decision uh, with gay marriage, how do we manage that from a PR perspective? It, was, it really wasn't a legal position, it was a PR perspective. Well, I was reading that and I thought, um, <clears throat> wow, I'm the new guy on the elder board. I don't know if we've talked about these things or not. And I'm also an attorney, so my mind is, is spinning from a legal perspective. And so I, I sent this on to the other elders and just said, asked a whole lot of questions. What about this? What about this? What's our policy on facility use? Do we have one? Um, if we don't have one, we probably should think about it. Maybe this already all exists. Um, well, that turned into a wonderful conversation and discussion about the fact that we didn't have any policy whatsoever on any of these issues. And so we now have a draft policy that will hopefully be adopted in the next, um, this month or next. And it's a two piece draft. And basically, uh, one of it is what is our wedding policy in terms of facilities? So um, it's, you know, bullet points. Here's the requirements for being married at West Bowles Community Church. In that wedding policy, then it references a position paper that we've put together on biblical marriage and sexuality. And so in that document, we reference this document and say, you know, this marriage has to be consistent with our, our beliefs and our biblical position on marriage. Um, now, so we're in the process. That's very important. So whatever organizations we're engaged with, thinking proactively in that way is super key. Now, um, certainly the fact that we have a couple of documents that we've adopted and put into our corporate records will not um, save us from a lawsuit. Um, that's not how it works. But it could give us a reasonable defense in the event we are sued. Certainly a much more likelihood of success uh, in the event that someone comes to our beautiful facility desiring to be married in a gay marriage and then suing us because we don't allow them to. So that, that, that is what we're trying to avoid. And we hope that we're providing ourselves a good defense for that. I'd like to pray now for strength for Christians, for all of us to be vigilant, vigilant in these matters. Lord Jesus, um, you've given us power as uh, sons and daughters of the King to stand up for what's right. Lord, we pray that we would be sensitive to the leading and direction of the Holy Spirit, that our hearts and our minds would be open, that we'd be aware. Lord, we know that you reach in supernaturally. You speak to us through your scripture. You speak to us through emails that our friends send us. You trigger things in our mind. Hmm, maybe we should look into this. So many times that's the Holy Spirit working in and through us. Lord, give us the strength to be vigilant in all these things. And as the scripture that Jim just read said, we wait and hope for you, Lord. You are our help and our shield. In you, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in your holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Lord, might you give us the strength to be vigilant in all these things. In your name, Jesus. Amen. I want to thank each of the presenters for thoughtful, serious, deep, important presentations. Over the last few years in the Strategic Objective Workshop Series, we've had many, many wonderful speakers and programs, but I cannot recall a morning when I felt that the presentation was as focused and as timely and as relevant and life-changing as it has been this morning. And I thank the presenters. <laughs> if there is anyone who came here this morning thinking the threat to American religious freedom uh, is sort of an intellectual or philosophical challenge from the friendly neighborhood agnostic who wants to stimulate a conversation, I hope you will now dismiss that completely from your mind. It is instead a relentless attack by those who mean us harm, by abortionists and sexual perverts and those who want to seize America's firearms and who want to consolidate all the power in the government and marginalize and 
and push to the very edges of society, individual people, especially those who follow Jesus Christ, and churches, and Christian colleges and universities, and people who are prepared to use unethical and unscrupulous means, and even brutality, even to subvert the IRS and the Justice Department and the courts and the Constitution to accomplish their purpose and to crush those who disagree with them. This is not just a, a conversation with those with whom we disagree. This is, my dear friends, a life or death struggle with human lives and the fate of nations hanging in the balance. It is of the utmost seriousness and consequences. We're going to return to this uh, discussion the next time we're together, which I believe is January 26th, and we're going to focus more on what are some practical nuts and bolts things, some of which have been mentioned. Paul, I congratulate you and your church for what you're doing. I agree with the things that Jim has already said, that Krista and Jeff and others have, uh, have mentioned. I, I certainly agree with Mike Norton's suggestion that we need to support Jack and Masterpiece Bakery and support them in prayer by buying cupcakes from them, by uh, lifting them up in every way, by passing the word. And in fact, before I go any further, and I'm about to conclude, but before I do anything more, I want to ask uh, Steve Miller if he would pray for the outcome of the Masterpiece court case before the state Supreme Court. Would you just give us a, a, a quick sure. word of leadership in prayer now? Yep. Dear Lord, uh, you know how important uh, this case is before the Colorado Supreme Court for Jack, the Masterpiece Cake Shop. Uh, we ask for your uh, <coughs> guidance, uh, your intervention with the justices on the Colorado Supreme Court so they will see the true light and the true way to decide this case. And we urgently pray for success at the Colorado Supreme Court so that this case doesn't have to go any further and so we can preserve religious freedom in this state. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Steve. Now, we're an educational institution, and I want to give you some homework. Between now and when we meet next, I would like to encourage you to look at four documents which I am going to uh, have available for you as we break up. Because we're going to have lunch together, we're not going to give them to you now as you depart from this room. <coughs> we're going to give them to you as you depart from the building after lunch. The first is uh, this 245-page beauty, <laughs> which is simply what I found in my file a few weeks ago. I started, oh, uh, I don't know, six months ago, throwing Religious Liberty articles and clippings in a file. And uh, a little while ago, I, I pulled them out, and we've compiled them. And uh, you will find this a remarkable reference source. It, uh, there's no editorial uh, content by me. It's just things that have come across my desk in the last few months. Uh, there's uh, the question raised by the Wall Street Journal of whatever happened to religious freedom, uh, a letter from Tony Perkins, one from Alan Sears. There is the uh, great statement by the German pastor Martin Niemöller about what happened in Germany. First they came from the socialists and read on. Look in this document on page 53. A warning from Canada about same-sex marriage eroding fundamental rights. The future of the Christian university. Uh, a story from the Denver Post about Jack Phillips and uh, uh, the uh, case that he is struggling under. Uh, also, a report from Houston, which didn't come up this morning, but I urge you to read it, about how the mayor of Houston got so worked up that he started subpoenaing the sermons of Houston pastors. Uh, the right of Christian colleges to deny married housing for gay couples, uh, some polling information, uh, the Chick-fil-A uh, story, which occurs, of course, right here in uh, Denver, uh, just, uh, just a lot of really useful, valuable information. I encourage you to read it, absorb it, underline it. And by the way, it, it will be available. Carrie, is it available already, or will it be soon available on the web? I don't know that answer, but I'll find out by this Okay, well, we'll get you a note about that. The intention is, I'd email it to you, but it's too big to email. So uh, it will be available to you, and there'll be a, we'll send you the, uh, the link. 
Second, uh, we will have for you one or the other or both of these two books. This is uh, Kirsten Powers' book, Silencing, How the Left is, is Silencing Free Speech, and it's especially interesting to me because she is herself a woman of the left. Uh, she's a very nice person. She is a follower of Christ, but she is left of center. But she lays it on the line about just exactly what's going on in the media, in colleges and university, in businesses, uh, a wonderful read, a lot of fun to read, carefully documented. And then the report of uh, Mary Catherine Hamm and Guy Benson on the same subject. Please take either or both of these. I think it is possible we don't have quite enough copies. When I look out into the number of people in the room, we may run out, but we've put uh, sheets where you can sign up so that if you linger over lunch and there isn't a copy of one or both of these available for you, just put your name down and check what you'd like to have and we'll see to it that you get it. And then last but not least, I want you to have a copy of this wonderful new book just published, Would the Pilgrims Still Come to America Today? The, <laughs> the Deteriorating State of Religious Liberty in America. This is a terrific book and it is especially meaningful because it is written by a young man who is and will for a few days still be a, a student here at Colorado Christian University, Nate Graz. Uh, Nate is actually a, a direct descendant of uh, someone who came over on the Mayflower. Uh, religious liberty is a particular passion of his. He writes about it with great power and strength, and in fact, Hugh Hewitt says, every age needs new voices and new champions of the first freedom, and Nate Graz is one of those. Well, we're really proud of Nate, who will graduate, uh, I guess, in a week or so, uh, uh, very, very shortly, and then goes off to Lincoln, Nebraska, where he will become the director of the Nebraska Public Policy Foundation. Nate's with us, and I thought you might like to say hello to him this morning. Nate, would you stand? Nate did not ask me to say this, but this book is available on Amazon, I happen to know, that's because that's where I bought a couple of hundred copies of it. It'd be a great Christmas gift, and it'd be okay with you if we bought up a few more copies for that, uh, that purpose. It's, it's a great read. It's, it's, it's a very lively, interesting book. Please look at these things between now and when we uh, meet again. Finally, I want to leave you with this thought. This is a very daunting matter. I mean, it, it is dead serious, very important. And we face formidable enemies, and behind the phalanx of those who are attacking us is none other than Satan himself. But we're going to win. We are going to win, and I'll have a lot to say about that the next time we meet. But for now, I want to tell you we're going to win for one very simple reason, and it is this. Second Chronicles 7.14 has not yet been repealed. I don't know if the Supreme Court knows this, but it has not. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and confess their sins, then I will hear them from heaven and I will heal their land. And therein is our hope. And so as this session ends, we're going to do the one most important thing. I'm going to suggest 20 things in due course. But today I'm going to ask you to join me in the one most important thing that we can do for our souls and for the future of our country, and that is to confess our sins and to seek forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Earl. My name is Earl Wagner. I'm Dean of Biblical Studies and Theology at the College of Adult and Graduate Studies, and um, it's been a it's been a great morning. It's been a uh, an engaging morning, and uh, you're probably tired of sitting morning. Uh, we're doing a pretty radical turn here. The session's over, but um, we're focusing on a time of communion before we, we eat our lunch. So let me start my little part in this by noting a, a biblical factoid for you. In 17 of the 24 chapters in Luke's gospel, Jesus Christ used the idea of eating food to communicate truth. Think about that. Over 70% of the chapters in the third gospel mention eating food. And of all the references over those 17 chapters, about half of them involve actual food. Jesus, other people, actually 
eating. I hear your thoughts. I hear your stomachs right now saying, Kags, dude, you're making me hungry. Why don't you just pray and let us go eat? <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. But let me take just a very few minutes to note simply that the idea of humans eating food, which we will do, <clears throat> excuse me, shortly, is important to God and not just for nutritional reasons. In those multiple eating references in Luke, we discover that the Son of God used eating events to meet people right where they are. God met people in the very mundane activity of eating a meal. For example, Jesus ate with regular folks, and hypocrites called him a glutton, Luke 7. Jesus ate with religious leaders, and they were ill-mannered to him, Luke 7, Luke 11, Luke 14. Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners and was condemned for doing so, Luke chapter 5. Jesus ate with and fed over 5,000 people, Luke chapter 9. And Jesus, of course, ate with his disciples before and after his resurrection, Luke chapter 24. So think about that. God Almighty, transcendent and yet imminent, showing up at people's tables showing up with them on the grass, showing up in their dining rooms, dirtying his hands by breaking bread and picking up pieces of fish, even creating community, bringing dining companions together when his presence was appreciated. Wherever people were doing the absolute basics of life, eating, God was there and still is drawing us to himself and to each other. Emmanuel, God with us, at the table, in our hearts, in the mundane, and not just at Christmas. Here's another reality God communicates through humans eating food, his grace. God uses meals to remind us of his grace. So I'm thinking now about this, about communion about the Lord's Supper. As CCU faculty and staff, we're gathered here in a very unique context. First, we are indeed gathered at work, no less, as a community of Christ followers. We represent Christian traditions all along the spectrum of evangelical Christianity. We celebrate this unique community with communion. Communing with each other, communing with God, using food. But, here's another unique thing about our gathering. This is not church. We're neither pretending that it is, nor are we implying that this gathering of Christians is anything more than simply a gathering of like-minded sisters and brothers in Christ. Given the rich and long tradition of communion as a gift to the church, if you feel uncomfortable participating in this because of your particular denominational traditions, understanding of communion, then you are free not to participate. This is not church. Finally, it follows then that this meal is not sacramental. It's a memorial. We remember the grace of God given to us by Jesus through his broken body and shed blood. We celebrate the relationships we have with him and each other because of that grace. We simply but seriously, as brothers and sisters in Christ, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 1 Corinthians 11.26. This is a memorial. So with all of that being said, and before we eat the Christmas meal and enjoy each other's company around the table, Pastor Dave, please lead us in this memorial meal. I'm going to ask that those who are helping serve, would you go ahead and, and get a tray and the bread together? We're going to pass them out at the same time. And go ahead and position yourselves at the beginning of the aisles, and then I will pray for us. And I would like to ask that we all hang on to the elements and to do this corporately. We don't always get to do that, to do it corporately, but this morning, 
the, the beauty of unity in Christ together. Hold on to the bread and to the cup, and then I will pray, and we will do it corporately. Just a word of instruction is that all of the bread is gluten-free for those of you that um, are in those positions. Let me pray for us and then go ahead and, and distribute. God, what a privilege to be gathered in the name of Jesus, to be gathered in the name of the one who did not consider himself um, too high to leave heaven and to come to earth, not only as a human being, but as a baby. And then to be crucified on a cross to death so that we could have life. God, in this Christmas season, we thank you that the baby Jesus represents, not represents, but embodies light, love, life, and freedom. Wow, we celebrate our freedom today. And God, as we receive this body and this blood, may we examine our own hearts as we wait until we can partake together of our right standing with you, of our relationship with you. Let us confess our sin. Let us pray and humble ourselves as we prepare ourselves for this celebration. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and distribute and hold on accordingly. Bow in prayer with me. God, as a CCU family, we thank you so much for the privilege of the freedom of gathering in your name and worshiping you and acknowledging who you are in our lives and acknowledging who you are in, the, in our university. And God, it's with humility and repentant hearts that we acknowledge that the baby in the manger of Christmas became the sacrificial lamb and rose on the third day so that we could have life and light and we could be a testimony to the world of the freedom that we have in Christ. God, we participate together this morning in celebration. Jesus took the bread, and after he broke it, he said, Take, eat this as a remembrance of my body broken for you. Let's eat together. And then he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant, the shedding of my blood, which marks a whole new life and a whole new way of life that we relate to God. Take this in remembrance of me. Take this together. God, we thank you that in you we are united and that we can share in communion and in community and in celebration. And we do celebrate today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Transitioning from this event into our Christmas luncheon, 
Chef Sheila has been busy with her crew preparing a beautiful meal for us. What do you have for us? Okay, are you guys excited? Because we are excited to have you. We're very honored to serve you today, so thank you for that. Today we're going to start off with a grilled, a grilled Brussels sprout kale salad, kind of trendy, a little different. And then we're going to go into a country salad. Yeah, it's not quite country. It's got beets, blue cheese, no bacon. It's got pecans. Love the bacon, but sorry. Then we have a honey glazed ham that we're going to do on trays. And we have a chutney, homemade. It goes with the ham very nicely. We'll have some hashed potatoes. And then on the side, we have a sweet potato. It has a candied pecan over the top. It is fabulous. I love it. It's so good. Of course, classic turkey, classic gravy, and then a ton of desserts. So if you don't find something you like, I would be surprised. So that we can't wait to have you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you. The food buffets are on the first floor at the big classrooms in the back. You'll go in one day, one door around the buffet for the whole day, around the buffet, out the other door. So kind of a flow thing. There's two different food buffets. About 200 of us can sit on this first floor. Another hundred will go upstairs, but you need to grab your food before you go up there. But if you eat up there, you have your own dessert bar. So, I mean, priorities, people. I mean, focus. So if you're on the second floor, you're going to get your food and then go up and go by elevator or by stairs. I hope that God gives you what you need this Christmas season, whether it's peace, whether it's all for all of us, peace, joy, love, beauty, all of the things, all of the gifts of this season. So God bless you as we go together and have our Christmas luncheon. Carolers, would you lead us out into the luncheon?